Welcome to Capital Report, a weekly discussion with your elected officials on the issues and concerns that affect you. Good evening and thanks again for your time with us. The road to wrapping up the state budget now seems to be hitting several potholes. Are some, most, or all of those centered on the debate over road funding? We'll cover that and much more uh, with my guest this week, Representative Charles Brunner. He is from Bay City, the Democrat representing the 96th District. Representative, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you, David. My Good pleasure. Good to have you here. We are sitting down on May 3rd, and our audience joining us on the 7th. Uh, June 1st is just around the corner of the self-imposed deadline for the legislature wrapping things up. And science had seemed to be pointing to a relatively smooth uh, conclusion to wrapping up a budget deal for fiscal 2014, but now news this week that things seem to be getting more and more sidetracked. Uh, where are the major divides at this point? Well, the, you know, as uh, the whole process begins with the governor laying out his budget and his vision for the state of Michigan, and from there, the Senate takes his budget and the House takes his budget, and they both either agree or disagree. The House uh, budget uh, is uh, significantly less than what the governor actually proposed. So there's a number of things that the House uh, is not funding that I think that the, the governor would like to see. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with Medicaid expansion. Of course, part of that uh, and the reason the governor wants to do that is because of the fact that we would get some federal funds to do that. Uh, there's the health care exchange, uh, you know, that's kind of up in the air again. That's federal funds, so uh, it's not necessarily directly related to this budget, but there are some uh, significant differences between what the Senate wants to do, what the House wants to do, and what the governor wants to do. Um, now that the House has passed a budget, uh, and I believe the Senate passed a budget, they will get together, leadership will get together, and they'll try to iron out the differences so that they can get it done. Uh, their self-imposed goal, by the way, is May 31st uh, or June 1st, um, our fiscal year, the state's fiscal year, basically ends, I believe, September 30th. It's October 1st to September 30th. So that's actually done well ahead of time in previous legislations uh, or legislatures. It, it, they would go right up until the end, as a matter of fact, spending long sessions trying to hammer out the budget differences between the Democrats and the Republicans. But, of course, since the Republicans are in control, um, the, this is my second term. The two budgets that we went through in my first term were both done by May 31st, June 1st. So it's a matter of the, the House, the Senate leadership getting together with the governor and saying, okay, what are we actually going to do here as far as uh, funding? Let's iron out our differences. Is it the type of issue uh, that's on the table, or, or I guess I'm wondering where, where more of the contention seems to be coming from, because there were also reports this week that Republican House Speaker Jace Bolger was moving to, or actually did, strip some Democrats from uh, their role on committees. I, I don't know how far you want to go into what happened in, in terms of some of the internal workings down there, but that, that seems more removed from simply a disagreement over issues? Was there yeah, a particular well, area actually, of contention if, then? If I may, I just, I'll go back, and I won't spend a lot of time on this because it's actually been worked out. Um, there, were, uh, there were some long insurance committee hearings on uh, no-fault insurance. And um, oftentimes uh, in committee, you don't know what the agenda is going to be until not even 24 hours before. Uh, sometimes it's just the night before and the committee's the, the next morning. So um, it was announced, uh, and, 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 and I don't quote me on all the, the exact timing on this, but uh, I believe it was announced there were going to be hearings on changes to no-fault insurance, which is a very, it's a very contentious issue, one of those uh, where you've got some folks that feel very strongly on each side. Um, but uh, during the hearings, uh, there are a number of folks that uh, were, re you know, that were recipients uh, because of no-fault insurance and the, uh, uh, the lifetime payment and the care. Uh, if you are injured in an automobile accident, very seriously, uh, that showed up to testify. And uh, it's my understanding there were a number of folks uh, on the Republican side that left. Uh, and I don't want to weigh in. I wasn't there as far as whether that was justified or whatever. But 
Um, uh, our leader, uh, Tim Grimal, uh, the leader on the Democratic side, made some comments about them leaving the hearing. Um, that led to the Speaker of the House, Jace Bolger, who has every authority to do this, uh, removing some, uh, some of the House members on the Democratic side that had missed a committee meeting uh, the, prior, the previous week. So there were about eight or nine uh, com uh, House Democratic members of committees that were removed from committees because of absences. And since then, by the way, um, uh, Speaker Bolger and Leader Grimal have met, uh, and they had a joint press conference just to say, hey, we've worked this out. Everyone restored then back to the world. Everybody's back to, yeah, everybody's going to be back on their committees. Okay. That's correct. Um, earlier this spring, you and a fellow Democratic Representative Stacey Irwin Oaks from Saginaw had uh, held a listening tour throughout some portions of the Great Lakes Bay region and then uh, moved on to what you were then presenting as a, uh, what you called an agenda for the middle class. Um, what did voters tell you in terms of some of the highlights there and, and uh, as you visited some of those committees? Well, or communities, I yeah, should say. Uh, our, uh, actually, our piece of the listening tour for our area stretched down in, and I went down to and we held it in Flint. And, but it was in an, in an auditorium where there were probably uh, around 100 people there, which is kind of interesting for a legislative event uh, to have people show up that just want to vent about everything from uh, not having jobs to losing uh, tax deductions to uh, pensions being taxed to frustrated teachers. And it was an opportunity for folks just to come up to the microphone and say, hey, this is what's important to me. And that's probably the biggest part of this job is spending time, either whether it's in the district or it's in the office, through email, through telephone calls, through snail mail, if you will, uh, just listening to what people's concerns are especially on hot issues. And, um, you know, as you know, there have been some things done, uh, a number of which have been aimed at the middle class, and uh, those folks showed up to vent their frustrations and kind of give us some feedback on what they thought about some of the things that are happening in Lansing. Were any of those then translated into uh, concrete legislation that's being crafted or worked on now you know, or, or anything that, yeah, that has yeah, even well, made it into the current budget? Yeah, actually, actually all will be you know, uh, at some, in some way, shape, or form, whether it's through a specific piece of legislation or whether it's through an amendment as issues come up, uh, we continue to, you know, to fight for the middle class, and so we take all that in. And if it's not a piece of legislation, if it's something that's being taken up uh, in Lansing, there will be substitute bills proposed, amendments proposed, or whatever we can do to help the, uh, the middle and lower class uh, folks of the state of Michigan who have taken a lot of hits uh, quite honestly, so that we can give business uh, some tremendous breaks. So while I disagree, where I understand why we did uh, what we did for business, I disagree with some of the ways that we got there. And so it's, it's rather questionable, at least up to this point, to see if all of those breaks for uh, businesses are, are really paying off uh, in the you know, in, in the form of jobs. Are, are we seeing the jobs? And uh, as everyone knows, you know, there isn't a tremendous amount of job creation. It's very slow, it's very stagnant, and hasn't taken off, I think, the way that some folks thought it would. Related to that, as we sit down on, on this particular Friday morning, um, you told us, literally from the road, uh, as it was impacting your schedule today, about a meeting this morning with uh, teachers and superintendents, all of whom you said, and I quote, had a lot to unload. What was the, what, what was the, uh, the, the framework of that, that sit down then and, and what were some yeah, of the things that, yeah. came, that came out of uh, the chance to sit down with educators today? Well, uh, the, the representatives in our area have a great relationship with uh, superintendents. Uh, it's actually, they have a quarterly meeting of superintendents, board members, and uh, some of the other employees of the school districts in Bay and Aranac counties. Um, and I kind of turned the tables a little bit this morning uh, rather than us giving an update, which we did, uh, very brief, uh, myself and Representative Johnson, uh, who now represents uh, Aranac County, and I think he's over into Gladwick, uh, Gladwin County, but some northern areas. But I said, look, we're here to, you know, to listen. You know, what, are, what are your concerns? And so we actually went around the room 
and it took a while to get around the room, and that's why I was late. It was on my schedule from 8.30 to 9.30, and finally at 20 after 10, I said, I've got to be in Mount Pleasant. <laughs> Uh, and I hated to do that uh, simply because uh, those folks had uh, some, uh, some, uh, some very good information to talk about. I mean, one of the things is uh, core curriculum, uh, which is coming from the federal government. And, I, and, and uh, don't quote me on this because I, I, I'm not in the system, I'm not working with this, but core curriculum, of course, is something that's uh, it, it's national to say in certain classes, these are some of the benchmarks that we're going to achieve or some of the standards we're going to set for those classes. Um, a number of schools uh, worked very hard, and when you do some of those things, you, you know how it goes. You put work groups together. You, uh, you invite in professionals, and, and it takes time to do and meet some of these uh, standards which are continually being handed down from uh, Lansing as well as Washington. And so a lot of work was put in on those, and there is some talk in Lansing about not applying the core curriculum now. So a couple of my uh, school superintendents basically said, look, we put a lot of time in on this. Uh, I think it wouldn't be wise now to back off. On so the state board and superintendent standards. Flanagan saying that there are elements of what they have been handed from the federal level that they they say maybe don't don't apply as well, or, or they don't. I'm not sure where it's coming from, but you know sometimes rumblings in Lansing turn out to be legislation, turn out to be executive orders, where somebody makes a decision then not to use that, and so I'm not sure where the the rumbling is coming from, but they're hearing it, and I read it in an article. And would educators um, be be um, expected then? Would, would these be changes for the coming year, or is there a, there a phase in over um, uh, a couple of school years to get the, very good these question? I don't know when they would have to be in place. I don't know if there's funding attached. I just know that I heard actually last Friday at a Bay Area Chamber speech that I gave, one of my stu superintendents stood up and said, "Hey." We've worked very hard on this core curriculum now to have folks in Lansing say, oh, no, we're going to change that in midstream, uh, they don't think is a good idea. Uh, so uh, obviously they, they understand the merit curriculum, which really is to, it's my understanding, even though I'm an educator, I'm not an expert on education, but uh, it, it's my understanding it's to kind of standardize what's being taught across the country core curriculum where it doesn't necessarily spell out exactly the curriculum but kind of set some standards that uh, that that can be followed across the country we uh, mentioned at the beginning that that at least one of the issues that has been uh, very much on the table through the budget debate and, and elsewhere has been the road funding question uh, the governor's asked for more than a billion to be spent this year saying that if we don't get to that level uh, the deficit spending problem on infrastructure would be even worse by 2014. Um, probably almost anyone we could ask would have their own figure. Is there a figure that you would pin on how much is the amount that needs to be spent? I mean, do road folks tell you that we could spend this much even if we don't get this much? I mean, what are, what are some of the numbers that are out there that, that we could be looking at potentially to start addressing yeah, some of that? Yeah, I've heard anywhere from 1.2 uh, to 1.6. Those are the figures that stand out in my mind that are kind of being thrown around in Lansing. I've been approached by uh, just about everybody you can think of and asked about road funding, and I've heard all kinds of interesting ideas floated as far as how do we pay for it. Uh, as everyone knows, to add uh, an additional amount to the gas uh, price right now uh, wouldn't be very wise. Um, to increase registration fees, I don't know where that's at. There was a, a rumbling um, before we took a, a brief uh, spring break that the Senate was going to try to pass something to allow for a referendum on increasing the sales tax by a penny. Um, obviously that didn't happen. So that's some of the talk. So well, something that Representative <clears throat> Tom Leonard brought up in, the, in, in what I did not realize at the time was that there is an amount of the tax, the, or the sales tax that actually was not going back into infrastructure, but actually was been being included in education funding. So education. if it was then Absolutely. set to the roads, then obviously folks interested in the education budget would say, okay, now we are facing a rather large Absolutely. deficit in how yeah, do we, it do we would, pay for that? Uh, and I don't know the exact figure. I know it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, 
from the sales tax of gasoline that actually goes to education, there are some people that are saying, let's take that money and let's apply that totally to the roads and one of, the, one of the suggestions, this is just a suggestion, this isn't Charlie Brunner speaking, uh, I'll see what comes out, um, but one of the suggestions was then go to the public and say, let, and say, okay, now that one cent is going to go to education, uh, when really it, it would, but it would be to offset now spending the uh, sales tax that's collected in gasoline to offset that money actually going to the roads. So there are so many, as a matter of fact, last Friday, here's one that I heard, uh, was mentioned at the uh, Chamber uh, State of the State luncheon. Um, somebody uh, suggested or it was suggested to someone uh, putting advertising on overpasses. Uh, so I think everything's on the table as far as road funding. It's just a matter of where do we get the funding for? You know, I said this morning to the superintendents, if I can get back to that just for a second, I said, you know, I wish our focus would be so strong on education and education funding and helping and fixing our educational system as the attention that roads are getting right now. Because I, to be honest with you, to, to do anything and saddle the middle class and lower income with anything, in my mind, uh, I couldn't support. I couldn't support a gas tax. I couldn't support increasing the registration. And I think that's why it hasn't got done to this point. Because I think the rest, of the, uh, not the rest, there are certainly some that would be willing to gamble. But I, I don't think there's enough votes there to, to be able to put that funding source together. If you've got two very big uh, needs with big price tags on them, uh, then are there other areas, you and, and your colleagues on either side of the aisle, that are saying, well, if we don't go down the road of raising a gas tax or raising vehicle registration fees or sales tax, any of these proposals that then have the effect potentially on both other areas of the budget that they say maybe some more cuts could be made so that f funding could go that way? or because we seem to be sort of then literally almost at, a, at an impasse or a four-way stop and, and uh, potentially both uh, issues not, as you are saying, getting potentially the, the attention that they should. Well, it's, and that's a very good question. Uh, you know, I, I think in the end, if, if there is some money, and maybe that $1.2 billion or that $1.6 billion is, is, a, is, a, is a, a, a bag of money that we won't be able to get to, uh, it may come from a number of sources uh, as far as cuts. It's just a matter of going into the budget and saying, okay, what can we cut? What can we live without that? But the, it becomes very difficult because uh, the state of Michigan has been cutting for 10 years. And so we're at the point now where we say, all right, where do we get that money from? I mean, it's easy to look at the prison system uh, and say, okay, we're spending $30,000 a year to house a prisoner let's cut back on that. But I, I have to tell you, I've been in those systems, not, but let me rephrase that, right. I visited. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I've been through there and I've seen uh, what these guards are facing and the cuts that they've already made uh, in that system, uh, you know, the DHS system. I, I, you know, people always say, well, let's, let's get, you know, I mean, there are people that are, that are really struggling right now and, and need some help and need some assistance. And the counselors, and I asked one, and I visited uh, my local DHS office, uh, they have five to 600 uh, individuals on their caseload. Uh, so, um, you know, we have made tremendous cuts uh, in areas. So can we cut some more? Are there some things we, that can be cut out? Uh, there always is. Uh, would be painful. I mean, they're uh, in the, I think in the House proposed budget, uh, they're closing uh, three uh, youth detention facilities in the state of Michigan. That's very painful. What's going to happen with that now? They're going to absorb those in some other systems that are around the state. So if we get to that $1.2 billion or that $1.6 billion or some amount that goes in that direction to start aggressively repairing the roads, it's probably going to have to come from a number of things. I don't think there's anything left where you can just say, okay, we're going to cut this and we're going to get that billion dollars. At a local and a state level, your counterpart in the Senate, uh, represent, or Senator Mike Green, has uh, proposed an idea for a shift in the way there is maintenance and uh, management oversight for the four bridges that go over the Saginaw River in uh, the immediate Bay City area. 
uh, a good plan? Does it help the local area of Bay City? Is it uh, better to see that shift as proposed more over to uh, the folks at MDOT? Oh, it would help tremendously. Uh, it's, it's really kind of a weird arrangement that the city of Bay City has. Two of the bridges are owned and operated totally by MDOT. The other two bridges, which of course are the kind that have to raise up and down because of commercial and recreational traffic on the river, the other two are owned by the city. Now the state does help a tremendous amount. Any, um, any refurbishing of those bridges, the state actually has been picking up the, the most of the costs. Uh, cities, the city's response, uh, responsibility has been negligible. But if, uh, if Senator Green is successful and he's in a position to do that in the Senate, in leadership, and if he can do that, it would be wonderful for the city of Bay City. Uh, I believe the figure is somewhere around a million dollars in the streets budget, wh which they could use to repair roads, but the most of that goes towards the maintenance and the operation of those bridges, which, which have to be manned uh, f so that there is a person there that can uh, operate those bridges as needed by the traffic that uh, goes uh, along the river. So that would be great for the city of Bay City and I hope Senator Green is able to do that. He's tried unsuccessfully in two previous budgets but he keeps trying and it's back in the budget and hopefully he'll succeed this time. It would be a very good thing for the city of Bay City. Well, we shift in our last few minutes then from the maintenance of the roads to the maintenance of the water itself, the dredging. Um, that is needed. Uh, the governor uh, got that figure close to the 20 million put into the state budget. Army Corps of Engineers also now has contracted for over a million dollars alone uh, with a firm out of Frankfurt to address uh, the needed dredging or at least a portion of it in the Saginaw River and the Saginaw Bay. Uh, it's supposed to be underway early this month. Um, for, for whatever information is out there publicly in terms of the area that's going to be addressed, the amount of the water that's going to be dealt with, um, we're making progress, all of it, some of it that, that is uh, needed in there. The, what does the proposal look like? Well, it's a huge discussion uh, going on right now because of the low uh, lake levels of Michigan and Huron. You know, to begin that discussion, I just had... Uh, I uh, had a meeting yesterday with representatives from, from uh, Senator Stabenow's office to say, look, I would like to meet with the Corps of Engineers and get some questions answered about the St. Clair River and the effect that dredging the St. Clair River, it's very controversial. There are some people that say it is the cause, some people say it's not, and I would like to get some definitive answers, first of all, to see if there are things that can be done in the St. Clair River. I heard proposals that there are things that can be done to at least stop the flow of the water of Michigan-Huron through the river to you know the other lakes and then out to the ocean eventually. So if that is a problem for something we can do to fix that, now getting back to my, my district and my local area, the Saginaw Bay coastal area is, is huge and, and really all those small streams and rivers flow out to the Saginaw Bay and Lake Huron. Um, right now the water levels are terribly low, lower than they've ever been before. And so with the Saginaw River, because it has commercial traffic, uh, it qualifies for some federal funding. And so, you know, obviously I'm very happy to hear whenever they appropriate some money in Washington to help with the dredging of the Saginaw River so we can continue that and, and expand. I'm hoping that we can do some things to expand that commercial traffic on the Saginaw River. Um, there are other rivers, and I'm having, I got a meeting in a couple weeks to discuss the Caucallan River which doesn't have a marina on it and doesn't have commercial traffic. But uh, it's a tremendous recreational river with a lot of housing and a lot of, lot of, lot of uh, folks that use that river for, uh, just for recreation to travel up and down. Uh, I've gotten calls for boat launches, um, you name anything that affects the water and I have a tremendous concern for the State Park Beach. Uh, Bay City State Park, which is a whole nother half an hour discussion as far as <laughs> how, what could we do for Bay City State Park basically to bring people back so that they can recre recreate and have a beach without Phragmites and without it being a natural area and get the muck out of there and uh, I mean it could be a huge economic generator for uh, uh, for uh, the, the Bay City Bay County area if we could get that beach uh, back in order. As a matter of fact, in, in my Committee on Tourism, we've been discussing just those kinds of things. 
uh, and it's a very interesting committee uh, to hear what's going on in the state of Michigan. And I believe tourism is the number three industry, uh, right behind agriculture is number two, and I'm on the agriculture committee as well. So uh, those are some uh, things in Michigan that are very, very important uh, that we develop. Well, you said at the beginning, uh, even as we sat down, how much time do we have? And we're at the end of the, the time. <laughs> but you said uh, fast, some, some yeah. of these things could be uh, another full discussion. Yeah. We'll have to pick it up uh, another place in time. But I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, cover as much ground as we were able to do uh, today. And always good to have you here. Thanks so much for, always a pleasure. for joining yeah. us. Thank you for your time and attention as well here on Capitol Report. We've been uh, speaking with Representative Charles Brunner, the Democrat from Bay City and the 96th District. As always, I want to say thank you to our crew and a reminder that this program is repeated in the overnight lineup into our early Wednesday mornings and then also uh, subsequently posted to the Capitol Report page on our website. You can go to WCMU.org, click on TV, and you'll find the link there for Capitol Report. I'm David Nicholas. For all of us here, thanks, and we'll talk again. You've been watching Capitol Report. Join us again as your elected officials speak to your concerns on current issues. Thank you.